by the long term. What we identified is the long term actually. So minimizing self delusion. Not <laughs> delusion. Uh, um, so actually it came from uh, right? So it, it was like uh, how to minimize the fact that you uh, tweak your own uh, protocol uh, and it goes a bit together with having this uh, on the see that we kind of build up on this first idea of having a well-defined workflow and then make it fully automated. So for that, define it with relevant observables and finally that allows some benchmarking. Um, on the benchmarking, as a side note, uh, you might have noticed that uh, Postcombiol has now a specific issue about benchmarking and this. Uh, so it goes in this direction, which is nice. So minimizing self delusion, so avoid tweaking yourself, your simulation to get what you want, and uh, rely on defined workflow. And rely on defined workflow involves, as I said, uh, find relevant observables to define and to be sure that we agree on the same uh, standard and parameter to be, to be defined. So, plus here, I feel it could go almost everywhere. Uh, and that's pretty here. If not important here. Uh, okay, to do that, uh, we already have some, uh, some tools. Uh, I'm going to repeat myself, of course, because yesterday we already uh, talked about them. Uh, for the workflow, BIOS in space, uh, empty trash. Uh, BIOS is code that didn't uh, show up till now, so it's a work from, uh, from Joe. Uh, so it's the name of the GitHub repo, yeah. right? BIOS is code, so uh, how to add one button to, uh, to basically launch your uh, your uh, uh, um, so what's, what's that called? Like, um, Biophys code. It's Bio. just GitHub Biophys code. Okay. Yeah. But it's what, what just like... It's a Python wrapper basically <coughs> to Gromax that lets you set up, run and analyze simulations. Okay. And a GUI. Um, so we talked about reproducibility of, uh, of protocols, uh, but also something important is reproducibility of analysis because actually uh, you might get the same uh, trajectory as a protocol, but actually two ways to analyze it, and then coming to different conclusions. You could have a problem in your analysis or whatever. So uh, reproducibility of analysis is really important. Uh, on tools like MD Analysis could be the solution to kind of uh, <coughs> have a common uh, workflow to do. So, reproducibility of analysis. Um, yes, so something important as well, uh, when you compare your, uh, uh, your data on what you got from your, from your simulation uh, and you want to compare with some uh, biological data, don't compare with interpreted data, compare with raw data because you, we cannot challenge you on raw data, raw data, raw data, you compare with raw data, that's fine. Interpreted data, yeah, that comes back to the root. Or possibility of analysis, you don't know how it has been interpreted, could have been something out there. Should we try to then uh, reproduce diffraction patterns? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And only intensities rather than distances. But how do we get experimentalists to share that? Say that? How do we get experimentalists to share mm -hmm. that data? Oh, they have to. It's just like, I have they've worked out all the information, yeah. it's now a strong medium where we can. Uh, I agree. It's about the same as me sharing trajectories, right? So yeah. <laughs> But you can imagine if you do that, you will have also, you may put that in some databases and the only difference between the experiment and MD results is just, you just add the tag mm -hmm. from MD, from experiments, to be nice. It's about say, linking right? data, right? So yeah. you can have experimental data in one repository and then you can have uh, simulations and so on. Oh, these two are uh, connected to each other. And maybe some people will understand what we are doing. There is some like, like raw data available, which is just the problem is that it's difficult to read. The person like me did So for the NMR, I can read those things, but I remember when I was not able to read them. 
So you have to understand the experiment quite well often to understand. That's a good it's idea anyway. Actual road <laughs> if you want to simulate an experiment, yeah, it's a good idea to understand the experiment in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, but then it's like you don't have time to learn half a year of each experiment often. Yeah. Because that's how that it sometimes it takes that too. But yeah, maybe anymore is just because that's probably the most difficult. I agree. But but, <laughs> but there is but there, there is Available, Should we say more that we should think. reach uh, uh, some kind of satisfactory level of understanding, maybe not be the expert in NMR, mm -hmm. but at least have some yes. uh, idea about it? And the we, we should learn to talk with the experiments with people. Yes, this, this I is, think that's... This is the key. You don't have to understand, you have to be able to understand, like, talk with them. I am absolutely for communication, because I think that's what we're lacking. I mean, I don't want to go in the lab and do the experiments by myself, mm -hmm. and we... But for some reason, we have now all these isolated companion groups, and then we have experimental groups, and then we try to like, locate each other's data, and I think there should be probably more yeah, uh, synergy. Yeah. One thing, for example, I, I thought yeah. that some parameters and more people extracted that I wanted to compare with my simulation, and they didn't agree. Um, I wanted to, to learn about this, the tacit assumptions which they made in deriving these parameters, so I asked them, what did you assume? And they said nothing. <laughs> what? Um, yes, it's called a model-free approach. The Paris example. It's actually that. a model. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so I said that is no model-free approach. <laughs> but this is a model what you're doing. So let's talk about. And in talking that, I learned about the assumption. And the funny thing was, they also they were aware of the assumption. And so that was very fruitful. And it's terrible branding. I agree. Um So. What we consider as an easy win on kind of well, obviously, if you want to make things reproducible, it should be accessible as well. So accessible repository, mm -hmm. GitHub, Zenodo, you name it. <coughs> that should have some good existing tools actually. Uh, and then luxurious because yeah, it's compli complicated. We already highlighted yesterday uh, full interoperability of MD tools. So if everything can be just switched and modular or just used uh, <coughs> together, yeah, you will achieve kind of reproducibility quite quickly. So I put it there. Oh, that's about this. biological questions want to answer, so not only test or whatever, or speed, but you know, delta, delta G's or all the parameters which are interpret the data. You probably don't want to go after relaxation rates because that's going to be hard. But uh, yeah, so that's, uh, it's not something which is in our hands, so that's something we need experimental people also to, to keep mind. But it's, uh, it's often, especially if you do free energy kind of stuff, you are collecting all bunch of data from different groups and experimental methods, and that's what we are benchmarking at. That's maybe D3R is only a good is a good way of doing that because at least the data in D3R are coming from the same groups and they have all been measured in a, in a consistent way. You hope. So that's uh, probably somewhere in the middle here. I think it's it's very important for the field. Uh, it's not too difficult, but we need to find what. We can do one more. Link to that, so we have more benchmarking. <laughs> okay, that's the standard benchmark set, we have it. Uh, benchmarks related to biological questions. Okay, you don't want to say, oh, I can run half a nanosecond and I'm getting the same results. So what, what is the question that you answer in half a nanosecond of simulations? Um, so that's probably also related to that one. Annual benchmarking by third party. So 
So not so by true. force field developers or software developers. Like once so a year, so everyone does So when we see in biospace, he's going to do that because you can run everything. I don't know, but uh, you don't have to compute to do this. Yeah, but, but you want something, then we need to define what we want to benchmark and want to do that. But you can say, okay, every year there's a new version, then we're going to put the benchmarks and publish it in some public uh, site, and, and that's it, and people can look at it. The danger is, is that, of course, the developer will say, but you didn't use our software in a proper way because you forgot <laughs> to tune that thing, so that's... Which is like uh, locally in the public community. Yeah. <laughs> so is it important? Uh, is it difficult? That's probably not so simple to arrange. Make everyone angry. But, uh, uh, what do we have here? Understanding MD parameters. Meta study on MD parameters. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, that was yours actually. And we put it somewhere here in the middle. I think it's important. Uh, it's for sure important for the people who, I guess, as developers, you should understand what the parameters mean, but the people using it, do they understand what it means? Uh, so Can that's you push it a bit more to the way? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very important. So, okay. And a bit lower? Well, yeah, it's not that high. We it's just not that high. Do it now. You could pass, but it might be challenging. And probably this is also about, so a link to that, I would say tutorials. So if you want people to understand things, uh, we should also provide tutorials. So that's probably easy to do. And uh, I think it's important. It's not well, I think it's important. Uh, provide a list of sanity reality checklist. Check. So if someone set up, so did you think of this, this, and this? Probably before they run their uh, microseconds, that's the starting point. Uh, so that should be, I would say, easy to do. And it's, it's, it will save maybe wasting a lot of resources. Having observed many students, it seems to be pretty difficult. <laughs> yeah, I guess, or maybe we should come with a list, but that's, uh, uh, so is there a, a good maybe quality, this is a checklist before you run your simulation? Or? Making people to use it maybe. Oh, yeah. But if I can say But there are a lot of things here that are not simple, because people will say, oh, you know, I've, I've modeled the 30, my example, well, I've modeled the 30 missing residues from that loop, and then I'm going to run a microsecond simulation. Probably you're going to get garbage, because you cannot model reliably 30. I was just going to say that like yesterday everything is important and difficult, so yeah. that's why you had stuff that was more on the left on your chart, I guess, because mm -hmm. you had scaled it. So. Yeah. <laughs> so there was something about important. killing features, so that was, I think, yours also. Oh, uh, I think... Uh, uh, so there's a lot of stuff that we have, but how much do we remove? I don't so know. essentially kill, killing feature, it was like killing things that we know are not working. Uh, so no, 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 but yeah, I, I think it was also by just reduced complexity. Yeah, even yeah. if things are working, even if we know the physics is correct, even if this is a part of software, even then kill it if it's not used by the community and understood and so on. So it or if it's abused. Yeah. 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 So I guess that's easy to do and that importance as well. But if there's also a known flawed protocol, it shouldn't really still be used. I mean, especially yeah. if there are better protocols out there. <coughs> so you flip up the safety cover, right? Yeah. So there was someone in Twitter yesterday when some people are following the, the Twitter feed that we have. We say, okay, we're speaking about formats and things. And they say, okay, don't define a new format for simulation unless you remove an other one. So all that new feature entails you remove one. Two. Or two. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. uh, Let's see. Uh, regression tests. Yes, it's important. I can see. Have you get it to game into tools? But that doesn't mean that it's really uh, that you will reproduce your simulation. Uh, education in statistics. I think that goes with tutorials. Multiple starting points, so just teach people that they should not run with single simulation, but they should have. So that, that's all about tutorials and education, I guess. Minimum standards for reporting results. So I think we, that came up yesterday also as well. So what is the... There is no defined standards that the journal requires. If you report a simulation, provide this table with these parameters in there or these statistics. It's there for NMR structure, it's there for crystal structure, probably as well. But there is nothing for standard simulation, so 
I think that's quite easy to do and it's also important. You don't go in a training part here. Uh, existing tools. So biosim space, MD trash, MD analysis, they are even to, to facilitate things. It doesn't mean that people are going to do less mistakes probably, but they also, for example, there's a Pymore plugin in uh, for uh, Romax. I don't know how up to date it is, but uh, and one question. Uh, so there are examples, or is it existing, or is it it's probably there? But do we need to store the software, the compile software, and the OS in a VM to be able to go back to that? I don't know. There is an initiative in the US called NMRBlocks.org where they're actually doing that. So they got funding from NIH to keep software versions, so different software versions, with a particular OS system. And if you want to say, I want to have version X running on this system, then there's a copy of that VM available, which you can start. So, so it's not only about archiving the software, but actually the executable and the, and the OS. Of course, for MD, this will not allow you to rerun re a microsecond of simulation if you only have a VM, but you might at least try to test a small bit of the code to see if you're getting ready to do that. That's question mark. Uh, <coughs> challenges, well, it's concern, difficulties. So what is the question? Okay, I think people should realize so that the clear question they want to answer before starting simulation is not always the case. I think there are still a lot of people running simulation. Now. Okay, what can I do with the data that I have? Uh, can, can, can I add to that one because the hypothesis was brought up previously? I think that's the much better way to put it, what is your question, than to demand that one has to have a hypothesis. No, yeah, I, I, I think agree. that's better. I yeah. think yeah, so hypothesis is somewhere there already? No, no, no. no it's People not. just mentioned okay, it, but mentioned. yeah, the question is, yeah. I agree. That comes from biologists, you always have to have a hypothesis. It's like psychology, yeah, yeah. now it's even worse, worse. Yeah, even worse. but now they are doing these pre-registrations, which I think for us may not necessarily no. have a lot of meaning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Concern, difficulty, available resources, link to repeats, so also for benchmarking, so if you want to make it a recurring thing, so do we have resource to do that? And one which is probably a link to understanding parameters, so it's concern, difficulty, coupling of force field software and MD parameters. Uh, so, so it's in there, but that's also a concern here. So force field is often parameterized with a given version of a software on some given hardware. And it doesn't mean that you're going to get the same results with the same force field when you move to the next version of the software on a different hardware. So how so resilient are the force fields to, to the details that are there when you use them? You should really just ship the machine you use to do the study. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's impossible to do. So we have to accept that there will be statistical differences. But then we can how much aesthetics, for do we accept? <laughs> And maybe if they are good benchmark, you can say it doesn't matter because you still get within your uh, of 0 0.2 EV uh, error <laughs> points. <laughs> Actually, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for the text. Of course. Keep remember, I think you can use the tape. You need to take it. I'm glad that we are reducing difficulties in this in today's session. Like in the previous session, everything was mostly piled up in the upper right corner, and now I think we are making like our life a little bit easier. It seems that we are in the in the sphere of possible today. So we, of course, uh, identified the usual set of existing tools for doing things that are uh, relevant to the questions of how, how do we have reproducible analyses. We obviously have analysis toolkits that are out there, uh, reasonably useful for their purpose. Uh, Daniel identified that there's an initiative called uh, Popper um, to do with trying to build more general reproducible pipelines for all kinds of computational sites, not just the molecular simulation community. So make sure we don't reinvent those wheels, go and use at least the ideas, if not the infrastructure that's already available for us. Hopper? 
pop up. Yeah, that upsets me. A O P B E O. That's the last one. Oh, yeah. As in Kalpa. Uh, we identified that we need to have uh, force field validation suites so that we understand whether the simulation tools we're using are actually fit for what they are uh, designed for. Very often people produce a force field that's just like, hey, here's a, here's a set of files, go and use it with some piece of software and you'll get the result that's written on the page. Uh, people update these over time, we need much better understanding of whether our tools are actually doing what they were supposed to say in the box. Uh, very often they haven't said on the box what they should do either. I, I, actually, IDPs are a good example mm -hmm. where a lot of force fields fail to actually. Mm -hmm. Sure, so you need to identify that yes, this force field was parameterized to work on this set of problems using this sort of experiment to work on QM data. As, on globular protein. So on globular protein, protein yeah. right. If the force field validation suite isn't, doesn't have examples of value in intrinsically disordered proteins, you have a much higher burden of proof in designing so, your study. So should we kind of aim for more specific force fields or maybe something that is more transferable? <laughs> First, we need to know what we have. Yeah, we currently don't. <laughs> uh, people just go, ah, oh, I used to use Ember. You know, I've switched I think, I'm going to keep using Ember. I think we need to identify where the problems are and then kind of think how to fix them. But I think I really don't even know where the problems are. Anymore. Okay. Uh, so we identified that people would like to be able to do the same kind of data analysis on uh, other systems, um, perhaps tweaking some of the, the parameters either in the simulation or in the analysis. That of course requires that people have shared the scripts that they use, so do you have actually the opportunity to attempt reproduction? Obviously there's a bunch of related things here about um, whether, where did they actually get put? Yeah, it's already up there somewhere. Yeah, I'm just looking for it. So there's, there's interoperability, but um, we want to be able to run the same analysis again for all starting points. It's the chain. Fully automated workflow, zero benchmark. Is that what it's actually? Yeah, we need. Interpretability of analysis. We need, yeah. we need shared scripts. Um, we need to be able to tweak an existing computation. But in order to tweak it, we need to understand what in fact it is. So we need all the information about which program it was run on, what were the parallelization settings, what were the simulation settings, all those sort of things are potentially relevant for establishing whether or not the computation can and should be reproduced. Sometimes, years later, people will observe, oh, there was a bug in this particular implementation of that package running in this way in parallel. We can go back and establish whether any of these results are confirmed by that bug. That's, that's a difficult thing to do at the moment. To enable that sort of process, we need to be able to share our raw input files so that people can actually see what it was. Very often there are defaults that are set up to in, in the simulation packages or in the analysis packages. They change over time. We need to be able to go back and see the output of those packages to say, okay, the default now was this. If we don't have that available, if all we have is one sentence in the paper that says, yes, we wrote Python scripts to do our analysis, your work, your work is essentially valueless. Um, <laughs> nobody can reproduce it. Yeah, this should be rejected at review time. Speaking of which, individuals who are reviewing papers should be much more um, strict. Yes, that was that's a diplomatic word to use. I was thinking of, of another one. Um, we need to be strict with each other and accept that we do have reproducibility, reproducibility crisis in our community, and part of that relies on us policing each other. When you review a, a, a manuscript, have a look to see whether you could possibly reproduce this work with the data they have shared available. They haven't got their simulation input files, they haven't shared their analysis scripts. What they have done is invent a bunch of numbers that could be random for all we know. I would argue that's the only thing we should be doing in reviews, right? Like that literally is our only job is to make sure that another competent person could reproduce what was in the manuscript. Indeed. This is an easy way. We should all be doing this. Getting the whole community to do it is a bit harder, so we, we acknowledge that there are two parts to it. Um, But of course, the more frequently you get a review response saying, I could not possibly reproduce with what you have made available, do better, then people will start building that into their experimental designs and the planning of their projects. And ultimately, those people will go up and they will be the reviewers and they will do the same sorts of things. So community change takes time. So the best ways to change people's mind is to wait before people who can't change their minds to die. But it also helps to point to something saying, here's what you should be doing instead, follow these guidelines. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's, that also, and as a community, we need to put together best practices and publish them in journals like Live Commons. So we, we know what we should expect. Uh, we need to have 
um, both experimental designs that permit us to gather statistics and to understand how to analyze them uh, appropriately. Uh, so that, that connects to something we already had, yes. That of course connects to how we got documentation and training available for people so that um, we understand that just doing a single simulation for 200 microseconds and then saying, oh look, the dynamics are this, it really isn't enough. Did you compare multiple force fields or did you multiple replicates? How did you assess whether your experimental design was potentially competent? Uh, sort of segues into the next one, are the tools we're using actually fit for the experiment we're trying to use them for? Most people adopt the methodology they're going to use from on high. They're a new PhD student, they just do what the postdoc tells them, they're a new postdoc, they just do what the PI tells them, they're shifting labs, they don't understand what the uh, expectations of the simulation community around the particular kinds of simulations they're thinking they're running actually operate. Very often people design an experiment without understanding, okay, what would I require from my analysis package or my simulation package in order that I can actually conduct my experiment? What data should I require that the particular version on the particular hardware with the particular parameter choices that I'm making? How can I know that this, this combination of choices and software that I'm going to use in the simulation, how do I know that they are fit for any particular purpose? One way this problem manifests is that when we update versions of analysis tools and software packages, nobody update, nobody takes them up for the first couple of years because they're all, I'm, I'm worried about there being a bug. <coughs> my, one of my responses to that is, how do you know you don't currently have a bug that's affecting your results? Most people haven't actually grappled with other tools I'm using likely to produce in some sort of reproducible or validatable way the ensemble that I'm actually looking to, 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 to sample. If you already have that, then it's very straightforward to run them again on the updated version of the software and take advantage of the new hardware and the new performance and the, the fixed bugs in the meantime. So if you never thought about whether your tools would fit, you just generate random numbers. Uh, should we maybe put that like, what is the question? Because I think it's also like, like we it's sure. kind of, it's like, what is the question? And again, what are the best tools to address this question? Like, yep. Maybe I would put it here. It's a challenge. Mm -hmm. it's a And careful design of experiments is something that connects on, on from that. We need to understand what we are trying to observe. It is valid to have an hypothesis free, uh, an hypothesis free walk in the park. But it is relatively unlikely that your look may just ran along trajectory to see what would happen. You're very unlikely to be able to defend the conclusion, ah, the dynamics of this particular membrane proteins diffusion is this. You need to design some other experiment. Having worked out that, oh, these things may be interesting, you need to do a broader study to actually say something about the, the time scale of the dynamics that you saw hints of in your first exploratory simulation. But we need to know in advance whether we're doing exploratory or something that's designed to produce some sort of quantitative result. Both are valid, but you don't just get to run a trajectory and then make the other. But my residues move, isn't it enough? No, that's not enough. <laughs> so, everything's doing good. Okay. I'm going to counter that, because we had a really, really interesting discussion at the beginning of ours which really focused on why are we running the simulations? What is the value we're trying to extract from the simulation? And actually, the value we're trying to extract might be a question of, is an experimentalist coming up to you and saying, I have all of these possible mutations I can perform to this protein. Which one of these mutations are the ones I should look at first? Or I have all of these different ligands, modifications to this ligand that binds well. Which one of these modifications should I try first? synthesized to actually go, and the computational chemist basically has to make that decision relatively quickly. They're not going to invest a huge cost to actually give that answer, because the value is I'm going to choose these versus these. And actually that is a combination of simulation, it's, it's to provide inspiration, and it's actually a combination of simulation plus intuition. So what you tend to find is that real computational chemists working in the field, the best one I saw was a med chemist who basically was great at designing drugs in her company. And what she would do is she'd run very quick simulations of, of dynamics. She'd look at the binding side, she would see where the protein was moving, and then because she had so much inbuilt intuition in her mind, from years of experience, she would say, aha, that looks like that might be a pocket about to open. I think you should begin functionalizing the ligand on this side. And that was the result she gave back. Functionalizing on that side, more often than not, gave drugs which found better, and she was a fantastic medicinal chemist who was highly valued by her company. But actually that decision of going here, or another decision of make these mutants in this residue, that decision is not a reproducible decision, but it's an extremely valuable decision, 
but did actually help the experimentalists get to where they're going. And what this really came back to for us is, what can you really expect from a simulation? So there are simulations you can perform where there are real calculatable, observable properties which you can link back to experiment and which you can use as benchmarks to move the field forward. But actually, that range of things we can calculate is so far less than what the experimentalists are asking us to actually give them. And that's why there is this gulf in reproducibility. Because if you're trying to do what the experimentalists want, you are really running hero simulations where the thing you're trying to calculate is so far beyond the autocorrelation time of your simulation, there's no way you can statistically converge it, even if you run a thousand replicas. So actually, these things you're being asked to, to run from the experimentalists, maybe we should stop trying to justify our intuition-based decisions by running these very complicated simulations, but we should actually sit back and say, let's use some quick and dirty methods for that and accept that we can't calculate those things. So the thing we actually eventually, we all got condensed down to one thing, <coughs> which was we need to actually set out best practices for planning simulations and be able to detect poor conversions and actually work out what is it we can calculate. And so if we put this kind of in the middle, and then the other thing we said. And then with multiple starting points. With multiple starting points. So what is actually the bottom? What is the thing you're able to calculate? So we basically have a, a protein where we know the motion of this protein is on the seconds time scale. Well, I'm sorry for using the example, but if this motion is happening on the seconds time scale, and the only thing you can simulate is on 10 nanoseconds or 100 nanoseconds, on the seconds time scale, you need to go through several motions, probably 50 of those motions, to be able to get any statistical convergence of that. No way can you run a 50 second simulation of this protein. And we need as a field to actually have the confidence to go to experimental colleagues and say, what you're asking me to do, I cannot rigorously give you. But if you're asking me for inspiration, and say, what things out of this selection, which one would I go to using my intuition and my knowledge of simulation, I can give you an answer, but it's not going to be a great answer. And I think we need to then actually say, go back to the quick and dirty methods and say, actually, this isn't reproducible because it is the combination of intuition plus experiment. Maybe I can add to that one thing yeah. I learned. It helps a lot to go to single molecule experiments because it's easier to simulate single molecules than to simulate catalytic yes. and single molecule. <laughs> and the single molecule field, they are very much aware of these averaging and, and stuff problems and challenges because they have the same thing, so it's much easier to talk to them. Mm. Yeah. And the experiments contain more information. That's it. My field, I kind of started with protein and then going down to single molecules. Yeah. Then you discover single molecules are also a lot of fun, but at least you can converge things. Yeah. And actually one of the things you learn in the single molecule field is you learn about autocorrelation times. Yeah. And you learn about systems of thermodynamics and you learn how to actually calculate your errors properly and understand that this thing you're doing, if the simulation autocorrelation time is longer than your simulation, then you're still in equilibration. And nothing you can do, no matter how many times I run the simulation, I'm still in equilibration. And so what we need is with our analysis toolkits, they should actually automatically calculate the autocorrelation time of the thing you're looking at. So the simulation can tell you, sorry, there was no point in running that simulation. Which is a horrible thing to say, but it's just the way it is. Um, in terms of easy wins, we do need to trust our tools, and as we've said many times in this workshop, our tools don't actually give us the same answers. Um, so different MD packages, different simulation tools, they give us different energies for the same force field in quotes. And actually a force field is a combination of the package plus the implementation of that force field. And so it would be a really easy thing to do is basically, if we did collect a benchmark suite of molecules, which have been parameterized in lots of different force fields, and we made it easy in our packages, so there's a little option that just said calculate energy and print the energy out. Amber doesn't do this, it's really annoying to get their single point energy because you've got to do one time step and back it up and everything else. But if we can actually make it to every single simulation package, you could give it a molecular file input in its own format, it just prints an energy out. We can then do energy benchmarking and at least be able to say all of our packages will give the same energy for this molecule parameterized with channel 35 or well, they get the same energies for this molecule parameterized with amber. That would be a really quick and easy thing to do. We've kind of begun that with biosim space, so I think it's something we could actually help to develop. And that was automated comparison of single snapshot energies and forces for codes, for different force fields. We then went moving on from that, is actually we need to do automated evaluation of the methods for physical problems. So once we have defined things, you can actually calculate in the code. So in the single molecule field, it's hydration-free energies. 
if there is anything like that in the protein field, and we couldn't really come up with something that you could actually calculate that would be useful, um, but if there's something like that, we could automatically run the simulation and collect that observable out, and then just see how different codes or different methods, could they, how close they could get to the experimental observable, that would be really useful and it would help push the field on. So it's easy to automate it and run it, it's difficult to actually work out what it is we're trying to get. That then moved on to this one, which is basically the automated sensitivity analysis to program settings. Because we have chaotic systems, so we know we make any change in the simulation parameter, it's going to change everything in terms of the simulation. But then statistical thermodynamics will mean actually that's okay, because statistical thermodynamics takes chaotic systems, merges them all together to give physical observables. But actually how sensitive are our simulations to those changes? Because the problem with statistical thermodynamics is basically, <coughs> it's if you run it for an infinite time, you'll get the average and it will work. But if we change the settings of the program, how long is the infinite time will change? So it will converge more slowly with some settings or converge more quickly with other settings. And so the average you ca calculate really will depend on what settings you use. So sensitivity analysis would be really useful. Can we uh, here? Here. Yeah. Uh, we said just define reproducibly computable observables, so actually defining them would be really good. Um, automatic benchmarking of force fields for physical properties, I kind of think we've already said that one as well. We need to define automated workflows for reproducible computable observables. We keep hitting the same thing. We need things we can observe, then almost like challenging the field and give us workflows where you're calculating it. And then once we use the workflow, we're going to run them basically validates that we get the same answers as you and then automatically run them lots of times. But to really make all of this work, we need to facilitate data sharing and discovery to enable the comparison of different simulations. So actually people sharing their data is the first step and that publishing everything. So the end of my life, this was brilliant. It was a great talk because actually just people publishing everything live is a field. If we just start publishing our simulations as we're running them rather than three months or six months after the paper was published, I think that'd be a very easy thing to do and would have high return on investment. Mm -hmm. And then existing tools, D3R, sample blind challenges. Blind challenges where somebody goes out and says, I have this thing I want you to calculate, which is a real experimental thing. And here is some basic input. Everyone, I don't care how you do it, calculate it blind and we'll see who wins. So this is what the D3R challenge is for uh, protein liquid binding for energy, so the sample challenge as well more of these challenges would be good. Maybe as a community you could work out what is your challenge from electrical dynamics. I come from the binary community so I don't know what it is, but what is your challenge for MD? What are you trying to reproduce? And then make a blind challenge competition out of it and then make sure everything is published. And then my life is just fantastic. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Any comments? Anyone else wants to say anything? Can I? Yeah, yeah. if you correct, uh, listen correctly, the calculation of the correlation times you put on the easy side. Where is um, I, I, I'd like to challenge that one. I think you cannot calculate the <coughs> of the correlation times, but to even find out whether you are converged or not in, in MD, because you may leave a complete large region of phase space unexplored. You will never detect that in your MD. You have no chance to detect that. That's the dangerous thing. It's, yeah. it's better than nothing. It's better than nothing. Yes. But it's yes. not as good as uh, having multiple starting points, right? Which is yeah. very easy yeah. on the yeah. scale. So. Yeah. Okay, so I think what we got again in this session, unlike other sessions, is that we have uh, uh, easy and important uh, uh, border and conflict field. <laughs> so I, I think that the, the thing is that a lot of things we can already change right now without actually implementing the tools, building any particular software or something. It just, we need to, what kind of comes across, we need to define actually best practices. I think that's what we are obviously sorely lacking. And to define what are we doing and how do we want to do it essentially. And for that we need probably better training more tutorials, we want to kind of, we should let people know what are the minimum standards, I guess, when, when you are trying to analyze data, like what is expected of you, because at the moment, I don't think there is a clear consensus, I think everyone agrees that you should probably uh, calculate RMSD, but like, then why, why is that, why, why did that become like a particular uh, a variable that everyone is calculating? Um, so, and again, going back to the challenge, like, why did you why did you calculate this? Uh, why did you run this simulation? What are you trying to do? And again, what is the most appropriate way of doing that? 
And that bring us, brings us to the more complicated thing, which is, again, obviously there is a need for a lot of automation, whether it's workflow or benchmarking, but I think the, the, the clear goal is that we need to automate as many things as possible, because then it removes this, um, uh, probably, I think it removes an, an, um, a possibility of, of introducing more errors, because, you know, we, we all, like, all, all make mistakes, and if you leave it to people, it's probably more likely there will be more mistakes introduced. Uh, and I think probably if we automate things, it will be easier easier to, to actually track down these mistakes and errors because then we can go back and actually uh, accurately track back down every step that was done and try to figure out where, where things went wrong. Speaking of that, it was also it's also clear that we should actually treat uh, simulations, and I mean in a way, we shouldn't treat force fields and software packages separately. We should actually, similar to a QM, uh, uh, when people like report we used uh, this level of theory with this basis set, I think we should use we will use this force field with this software version. Like it's, uh, but th that should actually be like really clear that it's like one thing that gives you this particular result. I mean, we do report we use this software package version, but we should really like make, make it even like a reporting standard, like a Ember, I don't know, 99 FSB slash Ember 12.0. I don't know, like something like that. We can think about it. And I guess how to make these things automated, it will be challenging, right? Uh, probably some things will be easier, some things will be harder. Uh, we definitely need to start sharing the data if we want to get any kind of useful information in terms of what kind of parameters people are using to run simulations, what, <clears throat> what values do they choose for thermostats, for barostats, what kind of values they use for their electrostatics, so on and so forth. How to do it, I guess maybe we came closer a little bit during the last day or two, maybe we didn't, I guess we'll, we'll see. And then I think we can. I think for the time being, we can all use the existing repositories, right? We can all dump at least the input files and maybe at least the, the initial coordinates and maybe even last and maybe even like five frames from the entire simulation. That's not really too uh, heavy in terms of uh, data. It's really easy, but no PDFs. I mean, again, going back to QM, QM people also share their minimized geometries. A PDF, which is not perfect, but um, <laughs> at least they share it, and we don't share like our PDBs. We share stupid figures and movies, and you can't. I mean, considering how much time we actually spend staring at the simulation and like looking at things from various angles, this is horrible. We should really use the ability of computers and these interactive uh, interfaces if we can, and we can, but we are just not doing it. And so again, going back to the most difficult part, as always, community, how to actually change people, how to make people to uh, do things better, uh, how, to, uh, how to train people to review, actually, uh, papers. There is really this interesting uh, initiative called pre-review, where, where uh, postdocs and PhD students are trained to do peer review. And it's done online, but they're, they're actually peer-reviewing, I think, bio-archive papers. So it's just kind of to train people what's important, what's, what's um, how, what, what to focus on when you are peer reviewing uh, papers and how to be constructively critical rather than um, offensively or something else. So maybe we can also create guidelines like how to, how to review an MD paper, like what are the minimum requirements, like what are the minimum reporting standards, what sort of data you should provide, is it like what, what uh, all the analysis scripts call, like what, what, is, what is this minimum package that every MD paper should, should have and ship. Um, together with the main publication. I think, that's it. I think okay, there are, we have tools to analyze, and we, maybe we can also ask if someone is willing to uh, uh, take the responsibility of maintaining MD trash. <laughs> um, uh, <coughs> we have challenges, and we also have some experimental data, but maybe we could also, or someone could te team up, Again, maybe this is more for like this collaborative approach and ask uh, experimental people to design some kind of experimental set that would be actually really easy uh, to compare to MD. Maybe we can come up or, like, or have like a, a different set for different functions for like binding free energy, maybe some, um, some other structural properties, NMR or FRET or D. Or like, I mean, there are like many things that are out there and maybe we can just like select a bunch of uh, proteins for which we have structure and then measure these things on multiple residues or something. I don't know, like, there are probably ways to do it, but someone has to do it and it's not, again, not exciting if one plan your nature paper, so how do we get there? I don't know. So, I, I, I don't want to be 
database content also experimental data, although now it's on, on the lipids, but I'm now working to find the correct parameters to use for proteins. Yeah. So at least NMR lipids is like trying to go. But that, that's there. lipids, and then you can have proteins, and you can have membrane proteins, and you can have DNA, yeah. then you have RNA. I mean, yeah. it, it, like the data set probably explode pretty quickly, and that's just NMR, but like we probably want to test against we, multiple. Yeah, so we have, we have now we have NMR data and scattering data now for lipids. But the, the, because the most important question is that you have to have good data, like what is good yes. data, what is, yeah. So for lipids we have this too, and for the proteins I'm working on. So we are trying to find what's the best. Yeah, and I think that's probably a challenge, how to get a really good experimental data for all this. One so, thing, I, one thing I, uh, you said something very important, you won't get a nature paper from that. And, and that's something which I think really plagues our field and yes. the other fields, because none of those things which we all seem to, to agree on are very important to <coughs> get us a nature paper. So how can we go around that? How can we break this dictatorship, I should almost say, <laughs> of having to publish in Nature and Science and, and, and so on? And, That's very dangerous. And this, uh, actually, I don't, I, then nature papers are not important. What is important is to get money. That's it's possible. important. It's important to get salary. So I don't care if I get papers in the nature. Yeah, but I care. Yeah. No. Yes. Well, this is what people think. That's okay. A fact. <laughs> Unfortunately. No, it's not. No, but I so I just got <laughs> five years of very good funding to do animal this project. Yes. Without any kind of papers published yes. on this, without any like vision to say that I would publish a scientific paper. I'm not saying okay. there's a 100% correlation, but if you have three major papers in a row that enhance your chances, yes. <laughs> it's, it's, about, it's about skewing is the this, probability this, of getting is this, a is this a fact? Is yes. it a fact? Yeah. Is it, is it like, like, do you have data for this? Yeah, there are data. Because I have heard, I have heard people claiming that there is data which shows opposite. It's, ah. it's not necessarily us that's the problem, and maybe not even funding, but it's the trainees. So if we have young trainees that are embarking on academic careers right now, they will need a nature seller science paper to get a decent R1 job. But this is, okay, but I have, seen, I have seen people arguing with the data opposite. And I'm, I, I just want to say this because this is what everybody thinks. And also one thing is that if everybody thinks like that, we are the scientists, okay? We are the ones who review the applications. If we think like that, it becomes uh, yeah. self, like, it, yes, okay. But so if, if, we, if we think like that, it's going to be like that. But can if I we stop something? thinking like that, it's not going to be like that. So we are the ones who decide in the end. So we have to remember that. So this is just why we I don't. Want to say and there is like a lot of once you enter in that state of mind, it's really difficult to get out. Like we still congratulate each other when we publish in like high impact yes. journals because we like, have great work. We like see on Twitter, oh this person published here, and everyone says like, oh ma amazing, congratulations. No, what is it, like, I mean, when you publish, people will tell you what good on you, but like, there is no this euphoria when you publish in a lesser impact. Uh, uh, I mean, it exists, it's present, it's not in, in, you know, in our heads. But, but, this, but we are deciding. It's the scientists who no, decide for them. Our senior colleagues at our universities are the ones who are deciding. Yeah. We have to persuade them. Yeah, but, but, yes. yeah. So but, but, we, but we'll wait for them to die. Yeah, what, what <laughs> we are going to be. Like, um, oh, <laughs> let's retire first. I Maybe the plan next will change it. Right? Yeah, because that's a hot topic, of course. Uh, uh, but if you're in a search committee or in an appointment committee or in a funding agency committee, you've got a pile of 100 CVs, for example, with pub lists, and you have to sort out 10 for a short list in a, over a weekend. And at that point, it becomes very hard not to pay attention to these hiring channels because you are very much tempted you cannot read all the publications, right? Mm -hmm. Simply not. There's it's a problem. <coughs> but so, so that's so a problem. I'm not saying yeah, it's yeah, so does it make any sense? Because now, now this means that the editors of Nature yes. and Science are actually the people who are deciding who is going to get a job. Yes. Yes. Uh, I will so, let so, Chris so, say the but, last but point we, and let's uh, move yeah, away from this, this topic this, because this I think we, yeah. we won't uh, get this anywhere. There is something we can change. And we won't fix scientific publishing. Can I just say, yeah, I don't want to say the UK is better, but one, the UK, most institutions have signed up to the San Francisco Declaration, which says they do not use impact factor to judge academic progression. The next thing we've done is in our research council, we're now exploring blind <coughs> peer review, yeah. where the actual, the person, your track record is now not seen by the reviewers of the grant. It can easily be found out. It can't. It's be anonymizing as much as possible. We actually ran a trial of it, and we found that the grants were funded, and they were not funded in Oxbridge. 
<laughs> and so there is a really strong movement going on in the UK, and I hope in the rest of the world, where we basically get rid of this thing. We've signed up to the Plan S, which is the method which basically pushes open standards. I think it's a really important thing, the San Francisco Declaration, Plan S, and a move to blind refereeing and blind refereeing of grants. It only comes in the UK because it was demanded by the research community, because the research councils have to follow the research community. Demand it from your funders. Yes, so there is power, but people are, are unwilling to voice their opinions or make yeah. stuff. I mean, it's just, we could change things, but we are not so So I guess, what are the concerns and difficulties? Uh, I guess, uh, in a way, who will do it, right? I mean, there's a lot of, as you said, like, uh, this is not glamorous work when you like some uh, a publication of a glossy journal. And let's face it, it's boring as well, right? It's, I mean, for some people, but there's like a lot of benchmarking, a lot of repeating, like it's a lot of repetitive work. You can try to automate as much as possible, but at the beginning, it'll probably be a lot of also, like, just like digging the tunnels and, uh, uh, all these sorts of so who will do it? Like should one research group take the burden of like two, three? Like uh, who will do all this work? Who I will burn all of their time? Yeah, maybe one more comment on that yeah. one. I sounded maybe overly negative. Um, so it, it may be true that you don't get a science on Asian paper out of it. But what is also true is most of these work create citations which last very long and are very high in numbers. And I think to get nature and science out of business much more important is to pay attention to citations rather than to journals. And there we have a benefit, and that may be a very good incentive for, for every one of us to, to invest time in this. Yeah, so I think this should be also maybe a really a distributed project, so we invite many people to actually contribute, so if, 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 someone, if everyone just does like a little part, then it becomes also easier and less taxing, so you don't have to like dedicate all of your time to it, and I think probably uh, live comms is also a very good place to publish these results, so we don't have to. I think live comms is a really great place to publish these like best practices that we are lacking, right? So we can update, we can change, we can modify, and we can add things that are actually important to us. And I think methods are really important because that's something that's transferable. Proteins will change. You'll have to like you'll have different proteins. They will behave in a different way. And sure, if you capture that rare event, it will be amazing and interesting to see, but at the end of the day, I think what we need to do is like make the methods reliable and trustworthy. So when you have a problem, you can say, oh yeah, I have this method and it's really good to solve this problem. But now we're, I think, we're, like, we're still kind of like a staggering in the dark a little bit. Um, so maybe we maybe should turn on some light and see uh, where the holes, potholes, not to fall into them. And I think I guess I'll finish.